Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Father God, I just pray as I'm going to do a new take, not a new take on Easter, but maybe present Easter in a way that, frankly, I, I haven't even heard until a few days ago. And I just pray, Lord, that you'd anoint me, that you'd help me to go beyond my strength, my intellectual abilities. And we just pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to fall upon every one of us here. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I have Gemma to thank for this. We had a conversation a couple of days ago. Got a little heated here and there, but she challenged me. Link the Old Testament with the New Testament. So if it hadn't been for that challenge, I wouldn't have got this revelation. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to John chapter 20, this is quite a mind-blowing thing. Most of you, if not every single one of you here, will leave with a different view of Easter. I promise you, your view of Easter will never be the same. And if we start out in John chapter 20, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Why do you think it says early first day of the week? He says this two times in this chapter. Because he's going back to Genesis, when the world was created on the first day day of the week. In fact, if you look at John 20 and 21, it's a very subtle retelling, okay, of the book of Genesis. John is a master at the art of subtlety. For example, you might just say, oh, the man born blind. Isn't that gross that Jesus spit on the mud on the dust and made him a new eye socket? Isn't that gross? Well, I wouldn't complain if I was blind. I mean, you could spit it on the ground as much as you want. But the thing is, is he took the dust from the ground which God made Adam. So the Gospel of John really goes back to Genesis. You'll never appreciate the Gospel of John if you don't understand Genesis in its core. So it says early on in the first day of the week. So already you're saying, well, why this information? And it's taking you back. Then it goes on in verse 19. On the evening, okay, of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. What does that remind you? When God created Adam, it was from his breath. Also, when Melanie was reading it, Mary thought he was the gardener. You see, the first chapter of Genesis, first and two, it starts with a garden. So John is doing this. And people who are rabbis in the first century, they would have known exactly what he's writing about. And it says, and he breathed on them, just like the Father breathed on Adam and he became a living spirit. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. So this is just a brief retelling of the new creation in Genesis. But really, what's happening here is Jesus is speaking to us and his disciples. And he's saying, look, I am sending you. I've done a new creation in your life. I've given you peace, and peace is a loaded word, shalom, victory, well-being, satisfaction. I've equipped you. You have all the resources you possibly have, but my peace I'm leaving with you. And then he breathed on them the same spirit that God breathed on Adam way back in Genesis chapter 2. So really, Easter is the launch of his new creation. And it says, Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in the newness of life. So Easter is about walking in the newness of life. But we've made Easter into this kind of the final climax. 
we've made Easter 40 days of Lent. We have like 40 days of fasting, of reflection, of the darkness of the garden. But what about 40 days of feasting? Why don't we live as resurrected people? Why don't we live as people walking in this new life? Why do we celebrate the fasting, but why don't we see the holiness and the magnificence, okay, in the feasting, in walking in the new creation? I think so many of us, we walk in our default way. We walk in maybe the old ways of our life, but walking in newness is an incredible challenge, and that's why Jesus breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit to launch his new creation. So Easter really is not this kind of, you know, climax on, okay, Christ is raised from the dead, and, and, and that's fantastic, but what about us? What about us? What's going to happen to us? It's fantastic that Christ is raised from the dead, that he's off the cross. Fantastic. But what about us? And we're going to explore that because that's the real meaning of Easter. How can we walk in the newness of life? Now, I've entitled this message, I just like it, The One Who Believes. I haven't called it The One Who Is a Christian because that has kind of cultural implications and it's very limiting, but the one who believes. In, in John chapter 11, verses 25 to 26, Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Let's just slow down here. We th I thought the resurrection was you, an event, something that happened, but here he's saying, hold on, I am the resurrection and I am the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die do you believe this this is really the question okay what he's saying are you the one who believes that jesus is the resurrection and the life do we believe this i don't know I believe it. Do I believe it 100%? Hopefully I'm getting there. This is something that I do. It. I believe it to the best of my human ability, but I need God to further reveal this resurrection to me because it seems so fantastical. Imagine if you were dead, your body decomposing like Lazarus, and suddenly you're alive again. It's something that's so incredible, so unbelievably good, and I want to believe it with every fiber of my body. And I do believe it, but I want my faith increased, so I believe it even more. Because if I believed it even, even more, I would just be different. I would walk around with this incredible smile on my face. You know, I would walk in victory. I would have peace. I would have joy. It's something that would change my life irrevocably. So I always say, God reveal this resurrection to me more this Easter than I know it before. So the question is, are you the one, you, who believes that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And Jesus looks at you. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Now, because you believe this, that Jesus is the life and the resurrection, Three amazing things. Actually, there's a lot more than three amazing things, but three amazing things, almost unbelievably good, are going to happen to you in this life, and especially in the life to come. So I'm here this Easter to preach good news that might seem to you like, whoa, this is hard to believe, but it is incredibly good news. Number one, you'll have a new place to live, You'll have a new body and a new job. This is what I'm talking about, okay? Because of the resurrection, because you believe this, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, you will have a new place to live, a new body, and a new job. And a lot of this, hopefully, you haven't heard, but you'll hear it now, okay? So, number one, you'll have a new place to live. Now, you might think, okay, I'm going to heaven. That's my ultimate destination totally wrong. You see, if I was in the time of Jesus, you had lots of philosophers like Plato and Plutarch, and they believed that your soul was trapped in your body, and that one day you would be liberated from your body and go to heaven. Have you heard that before? I have. 
almost every funeral that I've been to, almost every Christian sermon, I've heard that. Almost every church I've been to, I've heard that. You know, oh, it's, you're going to a better place. You know, you'll leave your body behind. It's riddled with cancer anyway. You know, better get rid of it. And Jesus will take your soul up to heaven and you'll live forever. And we've seen these books, you know, um, Heaven is for Real. And people have these experiences in heaven. It's kind of like a heaven tourism business. You know, some are real, some are not. We don't know. Okay, even the Apostle Paul went to the third heaven, but he's forbidden to talk about it. Okay, so here we have, I've just said something, that heaven is not our ultimate destination. Isn't that weird? I mean, most of us believe this kind of new age thinking, that, you know, we have this spirit, soul, trapped in this body, and we're going to go kind of float up, be taken, raptured up to heaven, and we're going to live there, well, for eternity. But that's not what the Bible says. Easter is about resurrection not about these kind of dismembered souls going up to heaven. Now, some of you are looking at me like, what's he getting at? Is he a her heretic? Okay, let's see. Acts 3, verse 21. Heaven, paradise, the same place that the thief on the cross was taken to, the same place that the apostle Paul went to, this paradise. Heaven must receive him, Jesus, until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So what it's saying, heaven is not our ultimate destination. It's temporary. Yes, Jesus is making homes, rooms, mansions for us to dwell in. If we were in a temporary, if I went to Cardiff temporarily, I would have to stay somewhere. Okay, but that's temporary. So let me read this again. Okay, heaven must receive Jesus until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So what did he promise through these prophets? Okay, how about Isaiah? Somebody was talking about Isaiah. 65, verses 17 to 19. See, this is written hundreds, hundreds of years before Christ. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. Really a rejuvenated earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. And it goes on describing this Hebrew concept it's so earthy. Heaven is so earthy in the Bible. It's not surreal. That's temporary. How about John in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. See? The same language that Isaiah is using. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea, meaning evil to the Hebrew culture. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So if heaven up there is our ulti ultimate destination, why is it in the last chapter of the Bible that heaven's coming down here? I thought we went up to heaven. Well, we do in a sense. But here it's saying that the ultimate destination of God and the restoration of everything is taking place here on earth. Okay. And I heard a voice, a loud one, from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. You see, folks, this is what Easter is about. It says we've died with him, we've been resurrected him in order that we may walk in the newness of life, which starts now. We're not going to get it perfect now, but we can start walking now. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Here's another one that blew my mind the other day. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Because I got it wrong for my whole life. And I finally understood it. And it says this. But our citizenship 
is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be glorious like his body. So just the same way that Jesus resurrected, the same body that he has, we don't know what it's like, can walk through you know, doors, and it can uh, do things that we can't do. He, can, he actually ate, you know, when he had this glorified body, so hopefully there's going to be really good food here on earth. But do you see what's happening? He's not focusing on heaven, on this paradise, on heaven is for real experiences and an other world he's saying no heaven is coming down and it's going to merge with earth that's what paul means when he says that that christ will unify everything on heaven and on earth easter the resurrection is all about the confluence the coming together the overlapping of heaven and earth itself he says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like the glorious body. Now, I always thought, because I was guilty of this kind of platonic, philosophical thinking that, oh, I have this soul, you know, and I do have a soul, of course, I'm not denying that, and it's going to go up with Jesus, and sure, that's going to happen. You know, but that's not the end of the story. That's why we have Easter. That's why we have the resurrection. We're going up to heaven so we can await our new bodies so we can be with Jesus here on this planet on earth. That's what it's saying. Okay, if you have another view, that's that's fantastic. But but show it. So really what this scripture is saying, what I thought it meant is, oh, you know, I'm a citizen of heaven, I'm gonna escape this miserable, terrible world and just get my ticket to heaven and just say good riddance to you and go up there and that's the end of the story. But it's not that. My citizenship is in heaven. And when I am in heaven, when I am in paradise, even though it might not be on earth, I'm going to be in a state, I don't know what I'm going to look like, but I'm awaiting my body so I can be with Jesus here on this earth. That's why it's called the bodily resurrection of Christ. That's why it says that death you have no sting left in you. If it was just my soul going up and my body dying, then death has not been defeated. But if somehow I get this new body, I'm resurrected and I have the same body type that Jesus had, then death has no sting. So at the same time, the Apostle Paul looked forward. He said, I would love to be with Jesus right now. It's far better. I would love to be with him. But I'm here with you guys. And while I'm here, I'm working for your joy. For your joyful progress in the faith. So he had this great tension. He was incredibly joyful because he knew that. But that's not what he was looking forward to. Paul speaks more about what's going to happen in us than the place that we go to. For example, let's talk about your body. I like that. Let's talk about your body. Let's talk about your body. Let's talk about my body. You know, some of us, we look in the mirror. Some of us like what we see, some of us don't. I was reading that Americans spent over $16 billion on cosmetic surgery in 2018. I would hate to imagine what they're spending now. For two primary reasons, to raise their self-esteem and to prove image satisfaction. And then I just Googled this, you know, and I said, I don't know anything about plastic, well, cosmetic surgery. Plastic surgery and cosmetic are two different animals. But if somebody wanted to get a breast lift, that's 5,000. Buttock implant, 5,000. Buttock lift, 5,000. Calf augmentation, 4,000. Cheek implant, 3,000. Ear surgery, 3,000. Eyelid surgery, facelift, 8,000. Forehead lift, 4,000. Liposuction, 4,000. Tummy tuck, and a complete mommy makeover between 10 and $20,000. I don't know what a complete mommy makeover is. But I would rather get the $10,000 one rather than the $20,000. So we have this in us, something. We want our bodies to look beautiful. Wealthy people in Silicon Valley are investing billions just to improve, prolong their lifespan. There's something in us that just demands resurrection. We want to live. There's something in our DNA that cries out for the resurrection of our physical bodies. Now, this is where it gets fantastical. 
Because I told you, if you read the Apostle Paul, he talks for far more about the person we're going to be we're going to become than the place we're going to. Because in modern culture, we hear all these oh, "I'm going to heaven" and all of these books and everything. But when was the last time you read something about what we are going to become? What will you look like when you're up there? What will you feel like? Not many people talk about. Whoa! I have this incredible body. I would love to have the vi a vision of the new body that I'm going to have. Okay, Romans 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I would expect it to say for us that we're going to go to heaven, we're going to see Jesus, everything is going to be glorious. And, and you know, if you're very spiritual, you'll say, all I want to do is see Jesus. If you're very spiritual, you can say that. But I remember when my son was born, I just wanted to check him out, make sure all the fingers, arms, legs there. Who's done that? It's a parent. You know, oh yeah, all right, woo! You know, and you get so excited about this little baby, you know, that this miraculous birth. So I'm going to check out my arms and legs and fingers and whatever I have. I don't know what I'm going to look like. But this is what the Apostle Paul says. Then he goes on, and if you suffer from insecurity, it makes you feel even more insecure. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That's you and us. So the whole creation, the stars, the universe, uh, uh, 80 billion galaxies away, whatever, it, it just waits in expectation for you. Like, hey, it's not all about me, but I guess it is here. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So there's a resurrection of nature, or maybe I, say, I should say a regeneration of nature itself. So all the beautiful things that we see around us, the beauty, the colors and everything, we only see 10% of the color spectrum, for example. You know, with our new bodies, our new eyes, our new vision, it will be incredibly different. It's almost like you were a baby in the womb. And when I was a baby in the womb, I was just like having these dreams. Hey, is, is this their all? There must be more to life than this. Pum, pum, you know? And it's kind of warm in here, a little wet in here, but ah, I'm sure there's something out there. And the critical inner voice, is, my baby voice said, nah, there's nothing out there. You're just going to die here in the womb, you know? And there's nothing out there. And then out I come. Woo! <laughs> this is incredible. That's what I kind of compare it to, like that. But here we have a complete resurrection, not of our human spirits, of our bodies, but of creation itself. And as I said before, Paul is more interested in the person we become than the place we go to. Then in 1 John, back to John, 1 John 3, 2, it says this, Dear friends, now that we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. For we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. I was reading on my BBC app a few years ago that if you took the population, say seven, six billion people, and we're all made up of atoms, right? You ever learn that? Okay, in school, I think everything is outdated what I learned in school. But anyway, you know, you have an, uh, an atom or something that's in this electromagnetic field. And it's like putting a grain of rice in 25 football fields, and that's an atom. It, so you look at that, there's no solid, there's no mass. So this one scientist, well not one, several of them were saying, if you took the mass and deflated us, all the atomic structure in us, and you put the body mass of six billion people together, it would be no more than a sugar cube in size. So when we think, you know, oh, this is my body, I can feel it. Actually, you can't even see your body mass under a microscope. Well, maybe a good one you could. That's what we are. We don't even understand reality. We don't understand. Some people think we're in this kind of simulation in this universe. Maybe we're simulated in the mind of God. But if you took the mass in the entire universe, it's very, very, very small. So for God to give us a new body, from my imagination, it's implausible, it's crazy, it sounds fantastical. But this is what he is saying, that we will get a, a, a new body, perhaps, 
the cellular structure and everything is going to be completely better. But it says we, we have died perish, imperishable, but we're like the seed and we'll, we will be raised imperishable. So I think this is an amazing thing, you know, to look forward. This is what the resurrection is about. So Easter is not saying, oh, hallelujah, Jesus is raised. Yes, it is. We get excited about it. But it says that Jesus was the first fruit. He was the one that, the trailblazer. He was the pioneer. He was the one. Just as sin entered, you know, the world through one man, Adam, life and newness enters through one man Jesus he started a new Easter a new resurrection because he lives we live because he resurrected we resurrect because he had a resurrected a certain type of resurrected body we're going to have the same thing too so this takes on a whole new meaning and it takes on a meaning that hey hold on you know what I do in my body um, when I die why don't I take more care of my body now it's a gift from God Say if somebody gave you, okay, Sophie, uh, I don't know, a 78 million euro racehorse and said you have to keep that racehorse for 10 years. And if you keep it for 10 years, it's going to win you another 335,000 million euros. Wouldn't you get the best trainer? Wouldn't you get the best food for that horse? Wouldn't you get the best partner for that horse? Wouldn't you get the best environment for that horse? But what? Am I saying that a racehorse, we're going to look after a racehorse better than I'm going to look after myself? So everything that I'm saying in the future has implications in our life right now. Now here's a weird one. What are we going to be doing in heaven? I have no clue. I have no clue what we're going to be doing in heaven. Okay? But I do have a clue what we're going to be doing when we're out of heaven into the new earth when we have our new bodies. Does that make sense? Okay, because usually so many of us will go out there and we'll just revert to the kind of pagan thing where we go up disembodied souls and we're in heaven forever and ever and ever and, and hallelujah. You know, that was a very well-known kind of pagan belief. And then the Jewish, the Christian people said, hold on, we do go up, but there is a bodily resurrection and we come back to a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. And we're going to live in a similar fashion, but it's going to be much, much better. Now here's where it gets a bit weird. Second Timothy, that we have a new job, okay? We have a new place to go to, we have a new body, and we also have a new job on earth, okay? In heaven, I'm not sure. Maybe we'll be praising, enjoying it, having a big holiday. I don't know what I'm gonna be doing in heaven. But when I have my resurrected body, I have a clue, and it gets a bit weird, but this is the Bible, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. This is a really strange concept. It says when we are on earth with Jesus, that we are going to be ruling and reigning with him. In a strange sense, even now, Jesus said to his disciples, you know, that his father has given him all authority and power over the enemy, the darkness, the evil one. And Jesus said, I've given you, all of us, all authority and power. That's why as Christians, we don't worry about some conspiracy theory about this and that and that. Because we are the only organism in the entire universe that has all authority and all power. But many of us, we don't use it like that. We just kind of like go back and we're timid to timid and somebody says the antichrist and, ah! you know we get scared and and then it goes viral and everything and more people get scared and we are the single most powerful people in the universe because jesus said all authority and all power i give to who give to you but we're not used to that you see that's easter living that's what Easter means. When Jesus said, for example, when he raised from the dead and he told his disciples and he bestowed upon them and gave them all authority and power, he meant that, hold on, I'm ruling and reigning right now. I want you to bring heaven down as much as possible to earth. Justice and peace, go fight for it. Your love, hope, faith, warriors here on earth and you have this incredible authority and power. Use it because you have resurrection power. And the resurrection is not just in the past, it's present tense. 
Paul, when he was having a hard time in Asia Minor, he said, you know, we've endured beyond we can, what we can endure, but we believe that Jesus still resurrects the dead. Present tense. We can all have resurrection experiences if we're at the end of our rope. But I'm the last scripture I'm going to read, and this is a strange one, but it's a beautiful one. Last chapter in the Bible. You ready for it? We started out with creation, okay? Then the new creation because of the resurrection. But this deals with heaven on earth, okay? Not a millennium, not heaven on earth. It says this, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, flowing with water clear as crystal, continuously pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. I mean, this is obviously a type of metaphorical, that sounds good already. If I was reading a tourist brochure, I would go to a place like that. The river was flowing in the middle of the street of the city. And on either side of the river was the tree of life. Where is this going back to? Genesis. Where is this going back to? John chapter 20, okay? With its 12 kinds of ripe fruit, according to each month of the year, the leaves of the tree of life are for healing. Now, Sophie, you're a psychotherapy. Is that, is it, do you know that this word healing is actually therapy? That's where we get it from. So I'll read it in that translation. The leaves of the tree of life are for the therapy of the nations. But full stop. You say, well, hold on. This is heaven. This is John saying, I saw the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down on earth. God will be with his people forever. He just says that. And suddenly he's saying that, this river and the trees and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Well, what nations? I thought everything was perfect in heaven. I thought, why would... Well, it says he's going to wipe away the tears. How long is that going to take? I don't know. Some of us have a lot of hurts and pains. Is, is there going to be therapy for us? But obviously... So, Sophie, you have a job. I've got a job. You have a big job. There. Hopefully it will be a short-term job and not a long-term job. But it says in heaven that there is going to be a process of healing and there's going to be nations. And if there's nations, that means politicians. And if we're going to rule and reign with Jesus, that means somebody has to look over the cities. Kind of like the parable. If you've been faithful with little, I'll give you five cities, okay? Because you've been faithful with a lot, I'll give you ten cities. So it's almost like, as one theologian said, he said, I don't want to sound trite or presumptuous, but it's almost like we're being trained to reign here. Like, this is our training day. Everybody see that show, Denzel Washington, Training Day, you know, where he plays the bad cop and everything. And there's something like that here, that this is our training time. It's like a military boot camp. Some of us are just getting, just getting everything knocked out of us. But we go on, we go through this obstacle course, and it's like we're on this training day. Because it's almost like we're being trained to reign, or trained to heal. Then it goes on, and every curse will be broken and no longer exist. Any bad thing no longer exists. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there in the city. His loving servants will serve him. They will see constantly his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They will never need the light of the sun or of a lamp, because the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign as kings forever and ever. So that's saying, maybe I should just call you King Tennis right now. Hey, King. That his destiny, literally, is he's going to be a king. Will he be a king of a nation? Is he going to be involved in this healing process? Is he still going to be playing the guitar? Not in heaven, but when heaven meets earth. Doesn't this kind of bend your mind a little bit? So... When I read this and explored this, my whole concept of Easter dramatically changed. Just to sum it up, Easter told me, okay, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, that I can start walking in the newness of life right now. So say if I don't know Jesus, you know, and I want to be the one who believes. Jesus said, do you believe this? And if you say, you know, I want to, I believe it a teeny, 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 weeny bit, but I can't quite get my head around it, but I want to believe it, and I want revelation, 
And Jesus, I don't have all the questions answered, but I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to say, yes, I believe this because I want to learn. I believe this because I want to go on an adventure. I believe this because I want to be resurrected. I believe this because I would love to be like a king or at least a prince or something, you know, in this, or part of this, this, this healing process in heaven. So it just changes your whole concept of heaven because suddenly you just say, well, hold on. This is not what I was taught. You see, that's because we all have a pagan view. We all go to the Louvre. We all go to the Prado. We all see these religious paintings. We've all, maybe you've been exposed to Dante and so on, the Purgatory, the Inferno, and we've all seen these kind of pagan cultural things. But like I said, when I was heading up a Bible college, not one, not one of hundreds of students could even remotely tell me what the Bible said about heaven and the new earth. Not one person could recite what I'm just telling you right now. Gemma was saying, you know, that, that it's a shame that in so many churches, the real meaning, I'm just saying, the real meaning of Easter, as you've heard it right now, most people have never, ever heard it. It's not like they're lying to you or it's fake news. It's just they're focusing on the wrong thing. We have to stop. We can focus. We focus so much on death, on dying, on, you know, but Christ is off the cross. You can wear a crucifix, and I'm not going to wear a crucifix with Jesus on it. That's an insult. He's off it. It's like my wife said, oh, my husband just died the other day, you know. He got electrocuted, whatever, and she goes around and shows me electrocuted on a, on a little ambulance you know, that, that she's wearing. It's, it's not like that. He's gone. He's resurrected. He's, the, the death, the suffering is gone. And we have to be resurrection people, Easter people, people that are living in the power of the resurrection. And that's what Paul prayed. He prayed that we would understand and know the same power that raised Christ from the dead is ours. And Father God, wow, this is like a reflection. This to me, even as I'm talking, I got a little dizzy. I was going to faint or something. Because it's just kind of too much to, to take in. And we pray. I pray for everyone here, Lord. Especially for people who do not know Jesus who is the resurrection and the life. And it says the one who believes. So if there is one who wants to believe, please come and see me. See Melanie. See Yoshiko. Just come up and grab us You know, after the service. I'm not going to say raise your hand now. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But this time I'm just saying come and see Melanie. Come and see myself. If you want to be the one who believes, and these things are so amazing, so energizing, so new. If you're tired of your old life and walking in oldness, why walk in oldness? Why retire so we can walk in oldness? Yeah? You know, let's walk in the newness of life. And Father, as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. In Jesus' name, amen.